everyone, and welcome to Adler Astronomy Live. My name is Meredith. I'm going to be your host today, and today we are talking about exoplanets or planets around other stars that aren't our sun. Welcome, everybody. As you all may know, the Adler Planetarium is currently closed to the public, so we're trying to find ways to bring some of our awesome programming online to you, and that's what we're doing today. If any of you have actually been in our building before, you might remember one of our favorite spaces, which is called the Space Visualization Lab. This is an area of the museum that guests can enter and actually talk to a real expert or astronomer about their field of science and see some really cool visualizations to help them understand what they're learning. So we're trying to bring that to you today. As you can see, we are all currently just in our homes. Uh, because of that, you might get some extra special features such as a technical difficulty or somebody's cat or child popping in to say hi. You never know. Uh, for that, we just ask for your patience and we hope that you're ready to have some fun. Okay, so we have some experts with us today. First, I want to introduce Lucianne Wachowicz. Hi, Lucianne. How are you? Hey, Meredith. Doing good. How are you? Good. Um, Lucy Ann is an expert and an astronomer at the Adler, and they're interested in all sorts of things, such as how stars might affect planets and their ability to host alien life really exciting. Um, uh, we also have Aaron Geller with us. Aaron is an astronomer at the Adler and at Northwestern, and he studies how stars and planets are born and how they might change over time. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Sorry, I have a little cough. That's okay. Welcome. I hope that uh, quarantine is treating everybody well. I wish we could all be together in the same space. Um, but for now, it's nice to see you all on the screen. Okay, so today's program is meant to be totally interactive. And because of that, we are asking that you please utilize the chat function in YouTube in order to ask us questions. You'll see Colleen is in the chat right now. Colleen is going to get your questions over to us and also share some cool links throughout today's program. So please ask questions. No question is ever too silly or too small. Uh, we want to hear from you. So wave hi to Colleen. Uh, we also have another special guest who's going to be joining us later, who I'm going to introduce later because they deserve their own special introduction. All right, I'm really excited. Let's talk about exoplanets. And to get us started, Aaron, why don't you tell us what is an exoplanet? An exoplanet is, well, another word for that is extrasolar planet. These are planets outside of our solar system. So as you said, Meredith, planets around other stars. And this is one of the most exciting areas of research in astronomy right now, if you ask me. Uh, for a long time, people have wondered what else is out there in the universe and imagine planets around other stars. And today we're starting to discover them. Uh, our, visual, our visualization expert, Mark Subarau, who is also here with us, has an image from the Adler's collections about this. And I see he's showing it now. Thank you, Mark. Okay, this is amazing. I can tell that it's old. Lucianne, can you tell us a little bit about this image and what we're looking at? Yeah, um, it is both amazing and old. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what we're looking at here is um, an item from the Adler's collection. This is an image from 1846 by Isaac Frost. And we're gonna, what we're seeing right here in the middle here is a vision of our solar system, right? So this is, our sun at the center, and then the many planets around it of our own solar system. If you look really carefully, you might notice some um, historically uh, interesting things, like for example, the planet Uranus was still called Herschel, um, the name of its discoverer at that time. Um, and uh, this was image was actually made at the same year that Neptune was discovered, but it wasn't included in the image yet. But you know what I think is really awesome about this is um, as Mark starts to zoom out, what you're gonna see is that this idea of our sun as being the host star for our uh, planetary system, there was this imagination, even though we didn't know whether planets existed around other stars for a really long time, um, you can see that the artist, uh, Isaac Frost, has drawn other stars with imagined planetary systems around them. And so it, it just goes to show you that for a very long time, the idea that other stars could be suns for planetary systems outside our own um, has existed in people's imaginations. And we just happen to live in a, an incredibly exciting plant and time in which we're actually finding those planets. I love this. This is a perfect example of just humans and how we can use our imaginations and how eventually we might find out that the things we imagined ended up being true. So how long did it take for people to actually start discovering other planets around other stars? 
Yeah, like I said, it was a very long time. Um, so that image that I just showed was 1846, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it actually took until the mid to late 90s for people to find evidence that there actually were planets around other stars. Um, so it really like was a very, very long time um, until we even had any confirmation that these things that people had been imagining were true. So uh, what you're seeing in the visuals Mark has up right now is a picture of our sky, a visualization showing planet discoveries with time. So as uh, Mark pans around, you're going to see little colorful circles um, pop up. You'll notice that these colors match some of the labels at the bottom. And we're gonna talk about those labels in a moment. They're just telling you different ways that planets were found. So cool. And in particular, you're seeing like lots of purple ones, right? And that's because these early planets um, that were found in the mid 90s to the uh, early 2000s or uh, almost up till 2008 were mostly found through something called radial velocity. But then um, in 2009, something amazing happened. Uh, the Kepler mission was launched. So Kepler was a space telescope that was designed to find planets around other stars. And so we went from knowing about 400 planets around other stars in the previous like 22 years to now having thousands and thousands of planets around other stars. So as you see that little part of the sky fill in with those yellow circles, so much so that it looks like really crowded, that's actually the part of the sky that Kepler looked at. And you can see like a little tiny Kepler um, in front. So you're just kind of feeling <sighs> down the tube of the telescope. <laughs> So amazing. Okay, am I remembering this correctly, Lucian, or were you at the Kepler launch? I was. Um, so I had the great fortune to join the Kepler science team just out of grad school in 2008. And so um, one of the first things that I did as sort of like a you know newly minted PhD was to go down to Kennedy Space Flight Center and see the Kepler launch. And it's, I mean, a, a launch is an amazing thing, right? You're sending like a thing that humans built like on a very, very big, like very fiery rod basically <laughs> and yeah. sending it into space, um, especially for anyone who may have watched the launch of the Perseverance rover yesterday or this morning, I guess. Um, so, uh, you know, it's exciting in and of itself, but also if you work on the science team, like that is your career. <laughs> like I would have been unemployed if anything happened to Kepler. Um, so it was like very, very, very nerve wracking in the best possible way. <laughs> yeah. And it was successful. Did you make friends while you were there too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, the wonderful thing about like being part of these big mission teams is that you really get to know a lot of people and it, it you know, people have this idea of astronomers as being like alone with their telescope, but it's really not like that. It takes hundreds of us working together often um, to make these kinds of amazing discoveries. So cool. I love the sense of community that launches like this uh, bring out of people. Yeah. Um, we do have a question from my Rose uh, asking about another telescope because we talked about how the Kepler changed the way we could actually discover exoplanets and skyrocket our number of exoplanets actually discovered. So uh, my Rose wants to know, could the James Webb Space Tel Telescope possibly detect chlorophyll on an exoplanet? And maybe you can just talk about the James Webb for a second too. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the James Webb Space Telescope is a telescope that's going to be launched um, mm -hmm. in the next year or so, um, maybe a little bit more. And uh, it will do something that Kepler can't do. So Kepler, um, as we'll talk about in a moment, uses this very specific method just to find planets around other stars. Um, but what My Rose is asking about is, can you detect the chemistry and the chemical makeup on these planets? And that's the big question for us. Kepler was amazing in that it found smaller planets than we'd been able to before, planets that might be like Earth. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you look at our solar system, if you look at Earth and Venus, for example, like they're about the same size, but it's the atmosphere that makes Earth a nice place to live and Venus a hellscape. Um, <laughs> so, so what uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to do is to maybe for some of these planets get kind of a chemical fingerprint of what their atmospheres are made of. Now, so cool. um, yeah, chlorophyll is interesting in, in particular because um, the way that we usually see it is in the fact that it reflects light. So, you know, when we see plants, they appear to be green because they have chlorophyll in them and that affects how they reflect the light. 
Um, so James Webb actually uses a different technique, but it will be able to sample what the atmospheres are made of and not necessarily um, what the, you know, any potential plants might be reflecting, but there are future missions that might be able to do that. So cool. And I think that answers a little bit of Megan's question, which was, are there different types of exoplanets? Um, uh, yes, because there are different uh, atmospheres, different sizes, shapes. Um, and we'll talk about that more throughout the program, but that's an excellent question, Megan. Um, I like thinking about exoplanets because I love shows like Star Trek and uh, when they visit all kinds of different planets and meet all kinds of different living beings on those planets. And I, I like Star Trek because it gets my imagination going and makes me pumped about real science like this. Um, and I know, Aaron, you agree, you like Star Trek, right? I like Star Trek. You know, I also like Star Wars. I know there's this, you know, debate out there between which is best. You know, they're both great. So we have a question for you all in YouTube land. How long do you think it will be before we find life around another star? Will it be 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, or never? So are you an optimist, pessimist? What do you think? Let us know in the chat. Yeah, Colleen is going to put that question in the chat. Please let us know how long you think it's going to be. I personally think it'll be um, over 100 years, but that makes me a pessimist, I guess. No pessimist, Doug. <laughs> I'm sorry. It just seems so impossible to me. But I also don't know that much about, you know, what goes into it. But I'm learning in today's program. Um, <laughs> uh, what are your favorite exoplanets, you two, Aaron, this year? Well, if I can go first, my favorite exoplanet is Proxima Centauri b. So this is a planet that's kind of about the same mass as our own Earth and it's around our nearest star system that's not our sun. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting also because it's in the, the planet is in the habitable or temperate zone around the star, which means that it's at a distance where the temperature is right, that there could be liquid water. We don't know if there is, but it has the right temperature. Um, this star is only, only four light years away, but it's close enough that people have actually talked about sending probes to so there's a project called Breakthrough Starshot that's trying to send actual probes to that system. It's actually three stars, not just one. The planet orbits one of those stars, but it's a three star system, which is really cool. Um, and I also want to say, I just finished re uh, reading a trilogy of sci-fi books. The first one's called The Three-Body Problem, which is actually about this system, three stars, three body. Mm -hmm. uh, and they envision some future where there's an alien civilization living there. It's by uh, Shishin Lu. It's a Chinese author translated into English. I have to read that. That sounds amazing and really Great exciting. Books. So do you think that that planet will be the first one that we try to go visit in perhaps 10, 50, 100 years or never? I mean, it's certainly the easiest one because it's closest to us. And sense. it's, you know, interesting because it's about the right mass to be like Earth. It's about the right temperature. Sweet. Lucy Ann, what's your favorite? Yeah, I mine is like not a very like well known star. Um, okay. So I have a soft spot in my heart for a star um, and its planets called Gliese 876. Um, it's named after this like guy, Gliese, who counted a lot of stars, hence 876 line in the catalog. Um, but I really like it because I studied that star in um, graduate school. And it's this little small kind of star, um, very red, called an M dwarf. And um, I really like it because in that work, I was using the Hubble Space Telescope to look at high energy radiation from stars. And it used to be thought that like stars like that could never have planets around them, that those planets could never be habitable. Right. And so I have a soft spot for it because my work helped show that it was really important to look at high energy radiation and that it made a really big difference for whether um, those planets that we found around these stars were habitable or not. So it wasn't just how much light they were getting, but um, the quality of that light and the energy of the light that was hitting them that could like control the chemistry in the atmosphere. Um, so that's like my personal connection to that planetary system. <laughs> so cool. You're an advocate for that type of star. I love it. I hope that we get to visit that star one day. Um, okay, we have our poll results in 75% say 50 years. Lucienne, do you agree? What are your thoughts? Um, so I have like a, a, if there's such a thing as a trick question, this is my trick answer. Um, okay. <laughs> so I actually think it will be um, sooner. I think it'll be 10 years. 
but I, yeah, I think it'll be really soon. But I think the problem is that we will argue over whether it is truly a sign of life or not. Um, and that's the really hard thing, right? Is that like you, you were mentioning going to these planets, they're really far away, even the closest ones. And so, you know, uh, on Star Trek, people like fly and can like go to planetary systems and like check them out. But mm -hmm. we rely on remote sensing and like these um, very like, I think very creative techniques, but they're open to interpretation and different scientists bring different interpretations to them. So I think we will actually find signs of life before we recognize that we found signs of life. This makes sense why I'm a pessimist because I'm imagining that we literally have to go to these planets in order to find life there. And we don't necessarily have to. No, we, we just definitely don't have to. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's Aaron, probably worth also saying just because there's the SETI group who searches mm -hmm. for actual signals that could be sent out from alien civilizations. But I think this is different from what you're talking about, Lucian. You're talking about like the question was detecting in the atmosphere or in the light that's being emitted by the planet. Is that right? Yeah. Um, you know, that is, is sort of like the most methodical way to like check for um, any kind of life. You know, SETI, I also work on SETI signals and like using um, computing to detect them. Um, but, you know, that could happen at like any time. Like literally it could happen tomorrow. Um, and kind of the problem with guessing when it might happen is that we have no idea like what other alien civilizations might do. They, you know, do they build machines that like send radio signals out into space? We have no idea. Um, so yeah, it's kind of anybody's guess. Um, but I would say as far as, as even those signals, I think we'll still debate before we recognize that we've detected signs of life. So I'm sticking with 10 years. You've changed me. I say 10 years now. <laughs> so, um, all right. For anyone who is just now joining us, thank you so much for joining us. This is Adler Astronomy Live. We're talking about exoplanets. We're here with Lucianne and Aaron, experts. Uh, we are taking your questions. Please ask us questions. Utilize that chat function in YouTube. We want to hear from you and we want to answer your questions. And say hi to Colleen. Colleen will get your questions over to us and share some really cool links. Um, if you're enjoying today's program, we are hopeful that you might consider actually donating to the Adler to help program like this exist while our building is physically closed to the public. Uh, any amount is welcome and appreciated, whether it's $2,800 for the number of exoplanets you believe could host life, or maybe you just want to donate $1 because you think that we are alone in this universe. Either way, it's appreciated. No amount is too small. And we, we thank you in advance. Um, okay, let's get back to exoplanets. Erin, how do we find exoplanets? Thanks. You, you know, Mark has a great visualization that can explain this. Can you throw that up there, Mark? Thank you. So Mark created this visualization to help explain these different methods. And what you're seeing in this visual, you're seeing a star and a planet. The star is the big bright object and the planet is the smaller object that's orbiting around it. Uh, for a real star planet system like this, the star can be millions to billions of times brighter than the planet. So we've done a little magic here, so you're able to actually see both of them. And also remember that many stars and their planets are very, very far away from us. So usually we can't actually see the planet in our telescope image, mm -hmm. although I'll come back to that. So really we need special techniques to identify most of the planets that we know of. And these usually require many, many observations of the same star over and over again to see changes that can repeat over time. And they also depend on the orientation of the system to us. So different techniques can be used for different orientations. The orientation that we're looking at right now is for a technique called the transit me method, which Lucienne talked about, uh, and this is what Kepler did. This requires the special orientation like we're showing now, where at this point, the planet passes right in front of the star. And when this happens, the planet blocks some light from the star and telescopes can detect this as an apparent dimming of the star. And that's going to happen once a year for the planet, once every orbit of the planet around its star. So we look for this periodic behavior as the planet goes in front. So this cool. is, like I said, this is a very special orientation. And most often the orientation is not quite right for this type of observation. And I see Mark is now moving 
the camera around a little bit, Mark, if you can move it so that it doesn't transit. So look here, the planet does not go in front of the star. But for these systems, we can look for the wobble that the planet causes on the star, the pull from gravity that the planet is actually causing the star to wobble. And in this visualization, you can see that wobble depicted in the changing color of the star. With our telescopes, we measure this wobble as the radial velocity. So that's the speed that the star is moving toward or away from us. So this signal also repeats each time the planet completes an orbit. And you can see that also in the visualization. Mm -hmm. To give you a sense for how much planets can actually cause stars to wobble back and forth, if you think about our Earth and Sun system, the Earth causes our Sun to wobble at a speed of less than a meter per second, which is slower than people walk. And that's the type of precision that we would need to measure, uh, to detect an Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star many light years away from us. And current telescopes and instruments can do this. And I think that's absolutely amazing. So amazing. Right? Um, can you tell us about why the colors are changing a little bit? So the colors are changing in a way to, well, of course, they're representing the radial velocity, like I said, but uh -huh. what radial velocity really is, is a shift in the color. So if you think of a star as emitting light, kind of that peaks in a certain color, when that star moves toward us, that color actually changes very slightly, much less than we're actually seeing in this, in this visualization. So it's very much exaggerating what you're seeing now, but that little tiny shift in color is what we detect and then we can translate that into a speed. Unreal. Uh, this is once again why I've been so pessimistic because I just can't fathom this kind of science working in today's age where like sometimes I can't get my phone to work, but it's amazing what we can do. Um, amazing. Yeah, the level of precision is just, uh, as you say, it's just amazing of what instruments are and it will keep getting better as we keep figuring out new techniques and new ways to do it. Let me go to one final technique to detect exoplanets, which Mark was just showing you, because yeah. that radial velocity and the transit method don't work for all orientations. So if you put the star face on, the whole planet system face on, that will not work. You need another technique, which for some special systems, you can actually take an image of the star and planet. And that's what you're looking at now. This is a real actual multiple images, looks like a movie of one particular system with the name HR8799. Uh, and what you're looking at in the middle, that black part is where the star is, but the star's light has been blocked out by a special um, technique. And those little dots around the side are actual planets that you're seeing. Wow. Remember that the light from the star can be millions to billions of times brighter than the planet. So it's like amazing that we can do that. It really requires blocking out that light. As, as an analogy, it's like trying to get a picture of a firefly flying near a searchlight about 300 miles away. What? Crazy. I have to echo Mia Rose right now, who just said, you are literally teaching me more than I've ever been taught in school. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Mia, thank you for saying that. Um, I'm learning a lot as well. Okay, so, what is this? Yeah, Mark just pulled up one image that we just added recently because it is uh, news from last week. And this is another directly imaged planet system. So this is a young sun-like star. It's about 300 light years away. It has a number TYC8998-760-1. Very exciting, you know? Uh, but it's, uh, it is a really exciting discovery. Two new planets. They're many, many times larger than our Jupiter and many, many times farther away from their star than Jupiter is from our sun. So it kind of goes to show that there's a whole wide range of planet systems out there. This one is way different from, from our solar system. Amazing. And we have the name TYC8998760-1. Uh, and we do have a question from somebody asking, what, how do you name exoplanets? Where does that name come from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously we, uh, we name them for catchiness, which is where we came up with TYC81, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, you might think that like uh, all of all of the exoplanets would have like super awesome names like they do in movies, right? In Star Wars, we have like Tatooine. Um, so, you know, the, the issue is that like 
first of all, there are a lot of exoplanets known now. Um, so when you get up to like thousands and thousands of objects, it's important to have like a way of naming them that kind of keeps everything straight. And um, the other thing is that a lot of times we name things um, that in ways that like acknowledge the mission that discovered them. So for example, um, when Kepler was doing its work, a lot of the first signals that we detected that might be planets, even before we knew whether they were planets or not, would be called Kepler objects of interest, spelled K-O-I. So we would talk about K-O-I and then like the number. But then over time, as we were able to discover more planets um, and confirm that those signals were that we were finding were actually planets, they would get more official names. So for example, Kepler 186, and then the planets are usually letters after that. So like Kepler 186b or Kepler 186f. Um, I know that's not always the catchiest thing, but it's a way of like naming the planet after its parent star. So kind of like, you know, human beings often have names that reference their parental ancestors. Um, they often use uh, numbering that references the parent star of these planets, just so that everybody kind of keeps them straight. Um, and we can all know like what planet we're actually yeah. talking about. Um, so so that, uh, yeah, like a lot of times like planets or, or stars will have multiple names depending on like who cataloged them when. So like Proxima Centauri is the common name for the stars that Aaron was talking about earlier, but it also has lots of other names in different catalogs. Awesome. Um, okay, well, that explains how a name like TI74 BB BIP <laughs> might come about. Um, okay, so so far we've talked <laughs> we've talked about we've talked about transit, which uh, depends on what orientation we're looking at a star. Meaning, like if the way that we're looking at it from here on Earth, can we see planets passing in front of it? Um, and then we talked about the wobble, and we talked about radial velocity. And Aaron, that's what you have focused on. You've done a lot of radial velocity observations. Am I correct? Yeah, that's right. I've done well. Really, going back to my thesis. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I went to uh, telescopes in Arizona primarily to measure the radial velocities of stars. Uh, I actually was not looking for exoplanets. I was looking for stars orbiting around stars, binary stars, two stars orbiting each other. Um, and this is a way of, that stars can form. They can form together. And I was trying to understand kind of all the characteristics of how stars form. Uh, so I did not have the fortune, I wasn't fortunate enough to actually detect exoplanets around these stars, but I did detect a lot of binary stars. That's cool. That sounds amazing to me, uh, just as cool. We have a question from Luke wanting to know, uh, what have been the most common types of solar systems or star systems? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of times you'll hear people talk about like, finding planets around sun-like stars, like in particular that image that Aaron just showed was the first like directly imaged planets that are around a star that is similar to the sun or like a younger version of our sun. Now, a lot of that is because we kind of want to learn as we learn about these planets around other stars, if we look for them around stars like our sun, they kind of give us like snapshots back in time of like other ways our solar system might've been, mm -hmm. um, but our sun is actually not the most common kind of star. The most common kind of star, like 70% of all stars are these little red M dwarf planets. And as we've learned over the past couple of years, the, the sheer number of planets that are out there, it actually seems like those stars have as many, if not more planets than the stars that are similar to our sun. And that means that by the numbers, most of the places that we might like even look for life in the universe are actually around these like little red stars that glow very faintly, that often have what we call like these big flares, which I think you'll hear about a little bit in a moment. And um, they shower their planets with like high energy radiation. So they could actually be super different places um, than you know, our life on our earth relatively far away from our pretty chill sun. Um, and so we're trying to learn about what life might be like in those systems if it exists there at all. Wow, this is incredible to think about. Uh, I wonder if life on those planets is fun or just very scary all the time with showers of radioactivity falling down on you. 
I mean, life here on earth is like fun and scary. So, probably. so true, <laughs> especially in the pandemic. <laughs> okay. So I think we have some more science news to share, but this is uh, the part where I'm going to bring out our very special guest who I am so excited to announce. Please welcome Emily Gilbert. Hi, Emily. Hi, Meredith. Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome. Um, okay, let me tell you a little about Emily. Emily is uh, Emily Gilbert is a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago and does research at the Adler. So we are lucky. She uses data from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, also known as the TESS, some of you may have heard of it before, uh, to study stars and planets. In particular, she studies flares from the smallest stars, just like Lucy was just talking about, um, and looks for exoplanets. Hi, how are you, Emily? I'm good, how are you? Where are you joining us uh, from today? Uh, from my lovely parents' house in New Jersey. I'm in the attic right now. <laughs> Amazing, I love that you're in the attic. <laughs> I love this. Um, okay, let me just explain something too really quick. Emily wrote a paper, which might sound simple to um, those of us who are not astronomers, but basically in astronomy, writing papers are kind of like currency. Um, so you find things, you discover things, but they don't really matter until you write this paper. You have to take what you discovered and write it up. Um, and it's also a huge collaborative effort. Lucy Ann once described it to me as herding cats. So Emily had to do all these coordination efforts and herd all these cats. Lucy Ann was one of Emily's cats, um, just to put that out there, uh, and to actually publish this paper. And the paper has been published. It is so exciting that we get to have Emily here. What a huge achievement, Emily. I don't know if we all want to clap for Emily. <laughs> I don't know what that sounds like on Zoom, but welcome. Can you tell us a little bit more about your paper and your discovery? Yes, so me and my small army of cats got together and we wrote a series of papers uh, describing an exciting new system of planets that we found using TESS. So TESS, like you mentioned, is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, uh, and it's a follow-up to the Kepler mission. So similar to Kepler, it uses the transit method to look for planets, like Erin described earlier. Um, and then we looked at a star called TOI 700 to look for planets. And like Lucy Ann mentioned, the name here, TOI, stands for TESS Object of Interest as a follow-up to the KOIs from Kepler. Uh, and TOI 700 is an M-dwarf star like we talked about. So it's a small, cool red star. It's about 40% the mass and radius of the sun and two-thirds of the temperature and about 100 light years away. And it was in the test continuous viewing zone, so right in the middle of this field that you can see here. Wow. So this means that TESS was able to look at this star basically uninterrupted for about a year and look for transits from these planets. So cool. So for a year, TESS just stared at this one spot. Well, it stared at a whole big patch of sky, but this part was in the bit that overlapped as TESS panned around the whole southern hemisphere sky. Amazing. So can we zoom in on the system now? Beautiful. So because we found this system via the transit method, we're looking at this edge on, and the first planet in the system is called TOI 700b. So we name them in order with letters. Uh, and it's almost exactly the same size as Earth, and it gets five times more light from its star than we get from the sun. And it's really close into its star. It's on a 10-day orbit. So in just a second here, we'll see it. Zoom. <gasps> Okay, <laughs> so here's our little star. We've got a planet orbiting around it. And it passes in between us and the star along our field of view. So now we're gonna rotate just so you can see the whole system. Then we kept looking and the next planet out that we found is called planet C. There's another one. Uh, it's 2.6 times the radius of the earth and it gets about 2.6 times more starlight and we think that this planet is probably gaseous, like Neptune, so it's a little bigger. And then the really exciting planet in the system is TOI 700d, the next planet out. And it's 1.2 times Earth's radius. And what's really exciting about it is that it's in the star's habitable zone. So like we mentioned earlier, this is the area around a star where a planet could potentially have liquid water on its surface. It's not too hot and not too cold. But because we're looking at an M-dwarf planetary system and M-dwarfs are so much smaller and cooler, the habitable zone is really, really close to its star. So we're in the habitable zone around our sun and a year on Earth takes 365 days, 
but a year on this planet only takes 37 days. Whoa. So, so it's quick. just moving really fast. Super quick. And we'd be super old if we lived there. I'm okay staying on Earth. <laughs> and because the system, because the planet is so close to the star, it's become, we think, tidally locked. So what this means is that the same side of the planet always faces the star. So this is what we see with the Earth-Moon system. So the same side of the moon always faces the Earth. And we were worried about what that might mean for potential for life on a planet like this, or what could happen to an atmosphere. So you have one side that's always sunny, it could get really hot, and then another side that's always dark. And so it could be super, super cold, and maybe the atmosphere would freeze and condense out, and then the planet would lose its atmosphere. Right. So we wanted to look at this, and we modeled the atmosphere of the planet, and we actually found that it, if it had an atmosphere, it could be really stable. Uh, and the most interesting thing that I think we found in the results was that uh, when we modeled the atmosphere, we found that the clouds all converged on the day side of the planet. So even though you're always on the sunny side, you always have a little bit of shade, which I appreciate. Yes. And what is that line called? Oh, yes. The but line that separates the day side from the night side has a great name. It's called the Terminator. <laughs> the Terminator. We were talking about how... Um, you know, it might be actually really cool to live on the Terminator because then you have sunsets all the time. It'd be beautiful. It's the most ran romantic place on this planet. Um, so cool. We have a question from Mia Rose uh, wanting to know what is the albedo of an exoplanet? Uh, I've seen the term thrown around in some articles but never grasped what exactly that's referring to. So the albedo of the planet is a measure of how reflective it is. And so this depends on what the planet is made of and what you're seeing. So things like clouds are really reflective or snow or ice, uh, but something like land is less reflective. So essentially kind of a measure of how shiny your planet is. Okay, great, I love that. I've never heard of albedo before, but thank you Mia Rose for asking because now I learned. Um, Chris wants to know, are there planets like Tatooine with multiple suns out there? Ooh, there are. Uh, there yeah. are. I can actually chime in on this because uh, it was one of the big um, Kepler discoveries was that um, there were not only planets that existed in multiple star systems. So for example, like Aaron talked about Proxima Centauri and how Proxima Centauri is one uh, star within like a multi-star system that has planets around it. But there are actually planets that orbit two stars as well. Um, so there is literally like a Tatooine out there. <laughs> Amazing. I love imagining standing on that uh, planet and looking up at two suns, but not yeah. looking directly at them, of course. We, we all know that. Uh, does Emily know whether, um, Emily, I'll just ask whether you know whether <laughs> there have been any like Tatooine-esque planets found with tests so far? There have. There was actually one announced in January. I believe it was the first one from the test mission. Uh, I think it was TOI-1338B. Um, we need to work on our naming schemes. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> Everywhere. Um, but they're really tricky to find because you have signals from two stars and the two stars passing in front of each other. And then you have to find the planet signal on top of that. And because of the way all of these different bodies in the system are interacting, the planet signal is not as regular as it is in the single star system. Uh, so it's a really big accomplishment when we find planets like this. So cool. Do we all agree that we should just name it Tatooine to make it easy? But then there's going to be so many Tatooines and we won't know which Tatooine we mean. <laughs> we like Tatooine one, Tatooine Also, yeah. George <laughs> will sue us. <laughs> Better point. Good point. Um, okay, everybody, please get ready to, la to ask any last minute questions you have because we only have a few more minutes of our program today. So please get those in the chat. Colleen is gonna get them over to us. Any question is good. Um, and in the meantime, Erin, can you tell us a little bit about any Zooniverse activities we might have related to Exoplanet's cool background, dude? I can't, thank you. Yeah, I just popped up this background <laughs> that I had. Uh, there is a Zooniverse activity. And so we actually have a really amazing activity for you that you all can do right after we're done talking to hunt for exoplanets yourself. And you don't need to be a scientist or have any special background or trainings or skills. Everybody can do this. And we'll show you everything you need to know right here. I think Mark has a screen grab movie that I made of myself on Plant Hunters. Mark, if you have that, can you put that up there? 
And if he doesn't, I will describe what you need to do. <laughs> oh, nice. I was kind of excited for you to describe it, but okay. <laughs> well, I'll still describe it. I'll still okay. describe it. Uh, okay, so you're looking at the screen that you would get to if you go to, to the planthunters.org website. And I kind of scrolled through a little bit, went, found the first one that I found that had what I think is a transit. And what you're looking at here is every dot there is a measurement of the brightness of a star and it's going over time. That's what's moving on, you know, it's what's on the bottom horizontal axis is time. And you see the brightness changes. And what I'm marking there are dips in the brightness caused by something, maybe a planet going in front of the star, like I mentioned before, transiting in front of the star and making that light from the star appear dimmer to us. And what you do on this um, website is you mark, if you see transits, you mark them as I've done here and you submit it and then you go on to the next one. They don't all, you know, you're going to come across images that don't have transits, but many of them do. And you can be part of this project to discover exoplanets on your own. It is a huge research project and people like you can really make a big difference to help the researchers and discover your exoplanets. I had so actually, Luciana and I talked about this. Mark, if you can put that back up. This is a really interesting one because there's this kind of up and down to the uh, light from the star. And when I first saw this, I, I, I picked out those transits, those really sharp ones. But then I was very unsure what that up and down was. I actually asked Lucianne, do you want to tell to everyone what you told me? Yeah, so I think one of the really fun things about um, these planet hunting projects, uh, like this universe project that um, Mark is describing here, is that you not only get to look for what the like whether the star has planets, you also get to see what the star is doing. And in this case, these I I literally had a professor in grad school who used to refer to things as upsy downsies <laughs> and light curves. Um, but what you're seeing is measurements of the star's brightness with time, right? So the things that Aaron has marked are these little dips from the planet. But the star itself, um, you know, stars have light and dark patches on them, and those are often um, caused by the star's magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields are part of what like create these showers of high energy radiation. So you can actually see like these dark patches that make the star dimmer, like rotating into view and then out of view and then into view and out of view. And that's what creates this like upsy downsies in the light curve. <laughs> so Thank cool. You. Yeah, and you can also see why we really need people's eyes to look at this because this is a crazy signal and it can be very hard for computers to pull all this stuff out in certain certain cases. Absolutely. So Colleen is actually sharing the link for Zooniverse. Please, please participate and help scientists to make these discoveries uh, because like Aaron just said, they can't all do it on their own. We need lots of help. Um, so you can help discover things with us. That's what Zooniverse is all about. Okay, we have a couple last minute questions and then we're gonna wrap up our program, which makes me bummed because I could talk about this all day. Um, but Luke has two questions for us. What, what are the most stars a planet has been seen orbiting? What is the most number of stars a planet has been seen orbiting? Hmm. I can't recall if there's ever been, I know there are triple star systems that have planets, but I can't recall if there's ever been a planet orbiting a triple star system. I think there has. Aaron and Emily, do you remember? Mark says four. <laughs> Thanks four. for the <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> See, there's so many exoplanets, I can't even keep up. <laughs> there's, yeah, right now there's over 4,000 known exoplanets. So apologies on our end for not being able to keep track of all of the 4,000. And then I have a quick question and I'll use um, my fingers. I, so there's four stars. Is the planet going like this or is it going like this? Do you know what I mean? In theory, it, <laughs> it could be any orientation, but there's, yeah. <laughs> Based on how I assume they discovered it, I'm guessing it's the second one. Oh, wait, okay. we're getting more information. <laughs> uh, it goes around two and two are external stars. Okay, so I'm making- That doesn't count as going around four stars then though. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Star system. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, and Luke also wants to know what, kind, what kinds of planets will the James Webb and other telescopes be looking at for life? So right now we have one known data point for life in the universe, us. Uh, so one of the things that we want to look at are planets that are most similar to Earth. We know that Earth can host life, so 
you know, we figure the best spot to look is planets that are most similar to Earth. So we're looking for planets that are the same size as Earth, that we think could have an atmosphere like Earth, so around Earth temperature. Um, but yeah, there's lots of planets out there, so we're going to have an interesting competition for proposal time for the James Webb Telescope. I hope that all the proposals are, are accepted because I love the idea of looking for so many different types of planets that are different from Earth. Um, okay, everybody, that is it for Adler Astronomy Live today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed your time with us. We learned so many things. We learned about the thousands of exoplanets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. Amazing. Uh, we learned about some of the techniques used to detect them. We heard about an awesome planet discovered by Emily Gilbert here using the TESS. And uh, we encourage everybody here to check out Zooniverse and help to discover some more exciting exoplanets. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, we apologize. Please email askadler at adlerplanetarium.org and ask your question and one of our experts will get back to you ASAP. Um, also, Colleen is going to be sharing a survey. Please fill it out. Let us know how we're doing, what you would like to see more of, um, and what you're loving. Um, also, Colleen is going to be once again sharing the link for donating to the Adler. If you uh, liked this program, we would love it if you consider sending us a donation. Any amount is welcome and appreciated. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining. Erin, Lucianne, Emily, Mark, who's out there in the ether, and Colleen in the chats. Um, please join us again in a few weeks. We're going to be back with another Adler Astronomy Live. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.